I just wanted to thank you keenly for the invitation to come back to Edinburgh and speak. It is a genuine uh, pleasure and privilege to return to the city where I first got interested in the history of medicine to give this talk. So thank you very warmly to the uh, organisers. So I want to take you back a few centuries. In 1576, a physician whose name was Annibale Giraldi set out from the city of Venice on a journey to one of the islands of the lagoon known as the Lazaretto Vecchio. This island was, and still is, the site of Venice's first plague hospital, which was established in 1423. This journey might not have entered into the annals of history, but for Giraldi's claim that justified his trip. He said, it was said that he had offered to perform miracles in curing the plague. And so, according to his own request, he was sent in a boat full of equipment, including apparatus for distillation, large containers, and casks full of liquids. An account from the time describes how Giraldi, this physician, and his servant, sadly, had hardly arrived at the Lazaretto Island, though, when the physician developed one of the telltale signs of the plague and promptly died. Giraldi was just one of the individuals who claimed to have found a remedy for the seemingly incurable disease of plague, which besieged cities on a regular basis during the early modern period. Giraldi's willingness to test his cure on the plague sick in a state-run hospital is perhaps more surprising, though, since it flew in the face of medical advice given out in plague time, which stressed that the surest way to avoid the disease was cito longe tarde, in other words, to flee quickly, stay long, and return slowly. This piece of advice was endorsed by even the most qualified of physicians and reproduced in their treatises on how best to respond to the plague, and many physicians took this advice themselves and fled from cities during epidemics, braving contemporary criticism. The exhortation to escape and the exodus of medical professionals from cities would hardly have inspired confidence in medical treatments to prevent and cure the disease. And given the devastating mortality rates associated with epidemics, contemporary criticisms of medicine in the time of plague as misguided at best and non-existent and harmful at worst are perhaps understandable. Historians have often picked up on these criticisms, which have complemented their own assessments of the false assumptions made by early modern doctors in the face of plague to characterise the recourse to medical treatments during epidemics as half-hearted, desperate and futile. But it's clear from the health office records which I've consulted in the context of early modern Italy, as well as medical tracts, that significant sums of money and quantities of effort were put into state attempts to prevent and cure the plague. In many cities, especially ports, the bastions against the disease came in the form of the civic plague hospital. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is to use the medical care provided by doctors within these hospitals to illustrate that practitioners use both experience and innovation to fight the plague actively. Some of what I have to say supports Sam Cohen's recent assertions regarding medical thinking after the Renaissance, which, put simply, says that doctors did not simply rely upon the medical thinking inherited from the classical world, but added their own observations and experience of the disease as they found it in the early modern period in order to attempt the most effective responses. And I am going to argue that these doctors did have a degree of success when considered in contem contemporary terms, although I'm going to leave you in suspense regarding the statistics associated with cure in these plague hospitals until right at the end so that you stay awake. Before considering the nature of the medical responses in these hospitals in more detail, I think it's worth providing some context regarding the island hospitals to which Geraldi was travelling to administer his cure at the outset of this paper. The Venetian hospital island, the first plague hospital to be established on a permanent basis, um, is going to be the focus of some of what I have to say this evening. Um, it's very useful, partly because it's the first hospital to be set up, it is taken as a, um, a model for hospitals set up elsewhere, and also its administrative records are comparatively complete. 
This first plague hospital became known as the Lazaretto Vecchio, and this beautiful 16th century map of the city shows you um, Venice surrounded by its lagoon islands, and I've circled in uh, green the two plague hospital islands that the city establish, establishes in the 15th century. And the first, the Lazaretto Vecchio, is in the bottom part of the picture, and the new Lazaretto, the, the Lazaretto Nuovo, in the top part. These two uh, sites were designed to work together. Um, in, early in the 15th century, it was suggested that men and women should be separated between these two institutions, and later in the 60s, that rich and poor might be usefully separated between the two sites. But what evolved was a system which centred upon issues of infection, rather than gender or social status. So the Lazaretto Vecchio was used for those who were already showing signs of the plague, in other words, those who had been definitely diagnosed with the disease. Whereas the Lazaretto Nuovo was used either for those convalescing after a stay at the Lazaretto Vecchio, or for those who were suspected of the disease. This tended to mean having come into what thought to be dangerously high levels of contact with the sick, um, normally being part of the same household as someone who had already died of the plague. Although quarantine literally meant, since it derives from the Italian word quaranta, meaning 40, the religious and liturgically symbolic period of 40 days, individuals could be sent into quarantine, in fact, for periods of 8, 14, 22 or 40 days, depending on the severity of their case. And in fact, their stays in these institutions could last much longer than 40 days. I've already mentioned that if you were sent out from the city, having shown one of the telltale signs of the plague, you'd go initially to the Lazaretto Vecchio for 40 days. Um, if cured, you'd then be taken to the Lazaretto Nuovo for another period of 40 days. Um, and if you continued to seem healthy, you'd be then be sent back into the city um, to your home, and you'd be kept in household quarantine, then probably for another period of 10 days. So that would be 90 days in quarantine. And it's important to stress that in Venice, this care, the care um, for these patients was provided by the state for the duration of this period. So food, medicines, clothing, heating, and so on, was funded by the Venetian Republic. The only exception to that was if care was being given to incoming merchants, since these hospitals cared for both those coming into the city as well as those who were Venetian citizens who were taken out from Venice if they showed signs of the plague. But for Venetians, this was care that was state-funded. The permanent plague hospital and system of quarantine which accompanied it were founded during the 15th century in part because of a change in the nature of plague epidemics that took place during this century. To generalise, during the 14th century, Europe experienced large-scale outbreaks of plague, many of them very well known to us, approximately every 20 to 30 years. During the 15th century, epidemics began to hit much more frequently, but on a smaller scale. So in terms of frequency, once every seven to 10 years. During the 16th and 17th centuries, we see another change in that epidemics start to hit cities less frequently, but on a larger scale. So returning in a way to the sort of 14th century picture. And in terms of mortality, these 16th and 17th century epidemics could kill up to a third of the city's population in a single outbreak. In response to the increased frequency of plague epidemics, public health systems were codified across Europe. And it might be helpful to think of structures set up to protect against the plague in Europe as falling into one of three divisions. The third division response to the plague was to temporarily requisition buildings or construct wooden structures that could be burned at the end of an outbreak. So in other words, it was to wait until an epidemic had been declared before you did anything about it. The second division response was to set up permanent buildings, permanent sites that could be used as plague hospitals, but only to use them during epidemics within cities. And the Premier League of Public Health for the Plague was to have permanent buildings that were in permanent use. This was, of course, by far the most expensive of the three options, not least because of the large staff that was required to support these hospitals. 
which did not just involve medical practitioners, but also those providing religious and charitable elements of care, which I'm not going to say much about in the course of this paper, but which would, of course, have been an essential accompaniment to the treatments I am going to dwell on this afternoon. From these islands of the Venetian Lagoon, the institution spread across the world. The so permanent plague hospitals were set up in 15th and 16th century Italian states, widely recognised as having been proactive in their responses to epidemic disease. In particular, a number of hospitals were set up in ports, and as you can see here, Venice set up two elsewhere. For example, in Sardinia, the city authorities set up four in order to allow different categories of patients to be kept separate because of the importance associated with protecting the trade economy. From the Italian peninsula, the institution spread to France, where a maison or hôpital pour pestifere was established in various cities from the mid-15th century, and Peshpitala were established as permanent sites in the Swiss Confederation, 16th century Germany, Spain and the Low Countries. England has had a reputation for being slow off the mark in terms of responses to the plague, but that's only really been asserted on the basis of the late introduction of national instructions from London. The excellent work of Paul Slack has shown that temporary pest houses were introduced in Shrewsbury, York, Windsor, Berwick, Durham, Nottingham and Newcastle, again during the 16th century. Through the 17th century, inst these institutions continued to be developed, but in a very different style. Two good examples of what changes in the 17th century come from Leiden and Paris. The famous plague hospital in Leiden was never actually used, it was completed in 1670 because the disease didn't actually return to the city after the completion of the building, but it was a grand, visible and symbolic structure. So too was the Hôpital Saint-Louis in Paris, built between 1607 and 1612, which has been described as the first monumental hospital in Europe for the exclusive treatment of the plague and identified as a key part of the urban strategy of Henri IV for the city. So these later introductions were much more impressive and um, often ceremonial in their design. Even where sites had been set up earlier, you see some Baroque redevelopment of structures. And this is an image of the plague hospital in Verona, which was set up um, in the 16th century. And you can see, I hope, the um, left-hand part of the image, that it was set up as a rectangular site. Um, the rooms were uh, placed around the edge, each with a portico. Um, what's added during the 17th century is um, this, what's called the tempietto that's placed at the centre of the rectangle. And the high altar is located in the centre of this tempietto. Obviously, the arches are open so that the high altar and the priest saying mass would have been visible from each of the rooms occupied by patients. And this um, lovely dome is adorned with a tiny statue of the plague saint St. Roch. And the other interesting thing about the um, developments in the 17th century in Verona um, is that at the time of setting up this tempietto in the centre, the authorities seem to have divided the rectangular structure into these four unequal trapezium and used this as a way of keeping different categories of patients separate. A number of cities only set up a single plague hospital, so they had to use space very um, cannily, and it seems as though um, these dividing walls were designed to make the administrative structure, which had probably existed in earlier centuries, a little bit more definite. Um, so we have 17th century um, more elaborate structures and indeed plague hospitals are set up through the 18th century and into the 19th century, although some of these later examples retaining the same term, uh, lazaretto, were in fact developed in response to other contagious diseases. So the structures are widespread but did differ in their nature and I've already emphasised that what is important is whether they were founded on a permanent basis and mentioned that in Venice they were, and as a result, the patients were served by a permanent staff. And I want to say a little bit about the medical uh, branch of that permanent staff. So there was a permanent doctor appointed to the plague hospitals in Venice, um, employed by the Venetian Health Office. There was one for the plague hospitals and one for the rest of the city, which gives us a sense, I think, of the importance placed upon treating the plague during the early modern period. Both of these doctors 
were tasked with visiting, diagnosing and prescribing for the sick in line with the Hippocratic treatment of the individual, the traditional method of the early modern physician. Broadly speaking, physicians were responsible for the internal treatment of the sick, meaning that they prescribed medicines which were for internal consumption by patients. And this branch of medicine was thought by some to be the most complex and learned since it required the practitioner to move beyond the superficial and what could be seen by the naked eye. Now, this um, assertion may not require explanation in the forum in which I'm currently speaking, but I'll just say something about why early modern physicians felt this to be true. Um, they distinguished their own work from the external treatments um, of surgeons, which they described as manual tasks more akin to the work of artisans or labourers. And this is, a, is, is, this is a distinction drawn in other fields as well. Artists, for example, claim the superiority of their work over that of sculptors on a similar basis. So Leonardo da Vinci wrote of the distinctions between the two arts, emphasising the sweat, dirt and dust involved in the manual labour of sculpture as indications of its less noble nature. For many years, historians of medicine have focused their studies of medical practitioners around the notion of hierarchies of status, education and wealth. The distinctions between medical groups have been said to solidify over the course of the early modern period, as the illustrious but belligerent physicians strengthened their hold over the regulation of other practitioners. But recent studies have done much to blur the boundaries between different groups of practitioners and to illustrate that the distinction in particular between physicians and surgeons has often been overstated. So physicians could practice surgery and often held degrees in both subjects. Health office doctors, whether their background was in surgery or physic, we know prescribed drugs and directed both internal and external medical treatments. As a result, it's unsurprising that occupational labels were applied to these health office doctors loosely. So those undertaking the role could be referred to as um, a medico, doctor, physico, physician, or chirurgo, surgeon, interchangeably. So these titles don't tell us very much about the background and qualification of the individuals who worked in these hospitals. But some information can be gleaned from the surviving lists of those who put themselves forward for election to the post. In the 16th and early 17th century elections, barbers and female medical practitioners <coughs> proposed themselves for the role, but were never successful. Time and time again, it was a surgeon who was elected. Richard Palmer observed this in the course of his work and said that the doctors employed in the lazarettos were normally surgeons since the treatment of plague cases, which might involve the lancing of bubonic swellings, was considered as primarily a surgical operation. I think this is partly correct. The doctors were often surgeons, but the nature of the medicine didn't dictate this because other surgeons, and particularly barbers, were appointed in order to cope with these sorts of operations. In fact, the background of the Lazaretto doctors was partly dictated by the salary offered and partly by the nature of the conditions within which these individuals worked. One further characteristic of the candidates for the post of plague hospital doctor is that they were often drawn from beyond the city, whereas those who served the city itself tended to be Venetian. And this is true of um, most Italian cities during this period, that they would have drawn their plague hospital doctors from um, other Italian states, France, Switzerland or Germany. We know that these um, doctors serving in the plague hospital did not belong to the colleges of physicians and would not have held the reputation or social status of these men. That's not to say that these colleges failed to input into the public health structures, far from it. They were often the first port of call for advice, um, but they were not responsible for providing staff to the city's health offices. Nevertheless, although the people appointed to the Lazaretti um, were not members of these uh, illustrious institutions, they were respected and trusted figures. And there is a particularly well-documented individual um, called Ludovico Cuccino, whose letterbook survives in the Wellcome Library. He served the Venetian Plague Hospital um, between 1555 and 1558, and his letterbook sets down the correspondence that was um, exchanged almost daily between 
Cuccino and the Venetian Health Office. And this makes it clear that Cuccino's responsibilities for medical treatments extended into the city as well as encompassing the two plague hospital islands. A number of corpses were sent out from the city to the plague hospitals as and when individuals' deaths were considered to be suspected cases so that Cuccino could conduct his own post-mortems. And he was also a point of information and advice for physicians within the city who wrote to him um, with descriptions of corpses and asking for his advice regarding the nature of the disease. Within the hospital, Cuccino was clearly in charge of the medical care and the health office officials sent instructions to two surgeons also serving at the plague hospitals, reminding them that Cuccino was to be obeyed as a doctor superior to them. And doctors worked in conjunction with the priors, the heads of hospitals and the chaplains as the senior figures within these institutions. They were relatively well paid. They shared the responsibility for the safety and security of the islands and its inhabitants through the safekeeping of goods and keys, as well as the maintenance of bureaucratic records, the interrogation of the sick and the recording of wills. So one of the most important qualifications that health office doctors could have were the skills to fulfill the bureaucratic aspects of their roles. Those appointed to the position of doctor to the plague hospital then were examples of what Sandra Cavallo has termed the learned doctor surgeon, someone who stood on the boundary of medical categories. But it's clear that these doctors were well educated and um, we have an inventory which survives of a library owned by one of these doctors from the 16th century, which illustrates the copious number of medical texts in his possession. It's worth considering, I think, what the incentive might have been for these medical men to take on the position of plague hospital doctor, since across Europe, the dangers of service in a medical role during plague were recognised. Those who carried out the work emphasised their personal sacrifice in supplications that they made in the aftermath of epidemics, so it's clear that they recognised the dangers themselves as well. Making these sorts of supplications meant that jobs could provide more than simply immediate material benefits and were sometimes used to apply for membership to a college of physicians or to gain the citizenship of a particular city, since I've mentioned that often these doctors were drawn from beyond the city. For some, the position was a rung on a career ladder and one which they undertook for a limited period, but more commonly, the role was retained for life. Now, bearing in mind the conditions within which these individuals were working, the service, for doctors for, the service of doctors for life may not be saying very much. But in fact, periods of service could encompass considerable periods, and individuals often tried to ensure that their job after their death was passed down within particular families. So just to give you one example, a man called Niccolo Colocchi held the position of plague hospital um, doctor in Venice for 25 years, and after his death, it passed to his son-in-law, Olivieri, who served for 35, who is the longest serving plague hospital doctor on record during the early modern period in Venice. There's little doubt, despite the uh, impressive track record of Colocchi and Olivieri, that the nature of the work of these figures during severe outbreaks of plague was arduous and involved contact with the sick. It's set down in hospital statutes that on arrival at the lazaretto, patients were seen by the doctor, and during their stays in the hospitals, patients were visited daily by both the doctor and the prior as a way of monitoring the care and condition of the sick. The priors were quite cunning in terms of their visits in that they tended to observe patients from balconies or doorways within hospitals rather than going to the bedside. But we know that the techniques which were used for diagnosis within the lazaretti, those traditionally associated with physicians, would have taken them to uh, the side of patients. And you can see the sort of um, diagnosis techniques that would have been in play in this engraving from the uh, plague hospital in Leiden from 1574. The physician stands centre stage. You can see him attending a female patient, um, examining the urine of that patient. Um, the obvious stretcher behind him, uh, which is being used to carry out the dead, does little to encourage confidence in this particular doctor's work. But nevertheless, it's clear that um, he's putting himself, if you like, in the firing line. 
by mixing with the, with the sick. The general features of diagnosis used by health office doctors, um, which was set down by the health office, were to veder, tocar, et medicar. In other words, to observe, touch and treat his patients. In so doing, there were particular common symptoms that these doctors tended to look out for. And it's useful that these individuals, the health office doctors operating at the coalface, leave us some sense of the symptoms they felt they came across most commonly. So Koloki, who I've just mentioned for his period of 25 years, wrote that the plague often manifested itself at the beginning with fever, pain in the back and painful headaches. And it was on the second day when boils might appear, either on the ear, the hip or the thigh. And it was said that these could be treated with a balm to reduce the pain. If the disease came on without a fever, Koloki felt that they would be certain of cure. For Cuccino, one of the most telling and common signs of the disease was the distinctive carbone, which was small pustules with black centres. And he refers to these signs a number of times in his letter book, mentioning them particularly on arms and on thighs. And he also refers frequently to the rage and madness associated with those suffering from the disease. A final 17th century plague hospital doctor refers to blisters, tumours and what are called black patechie, which were um, black and blue blemishes on the skin as being the most common signs of the disease. None of the Venetian plague hospital, hospital doctors mentioned nausea and vomiting in their accounts of the plague sick, although this was a common element mentioned in 17th century descriptions elsewhere. In addition to diagnosing the disease within the hospitals, the doctors were called upon to provide the health office with information that could be distributed to the public to facilitate swift diagnosis in the home. And there were two areas that this advice focused in on. The first was the identification of the disease in dead bodies. Corpses were thought to be a potential conduit of the disease, so the health office felt that it was important that signs could be identified as quickly as possible so that any dangerous bodies could be safely buried. And in a description unlike anything else I found, Koloki, um, who I've been mentioning already, provided a method for testing for infection before any visible signs of the plague had emerged, so before any swellings had appeared. And in this account, it's emphasised that this is something which could be done easily in the home with no requirement for supplies, equipment or expertise. <laughs> now, this isn't something I've tried myself. I think historians of medicine are often hypochondriacs, so I don't want to know whether or not I've got plague or not. But if you feel like the blood to your brain is lacking at the moment, you might try this. You have to hold your head still, roll your eyes as many times as possible up to the sky and then to the right and the left. And if this brings on tears, severe pain, and bloodshot eyes, then I'm afraid you've got the plague. Once the disease had been diagnosed, the doctors obviously were then were in charge of directing treatments. A printed treatise by the physician Thibaldi, um, who's operating in the 17th century, provides information about the sorts of treatments that should be provided in the lazaretti. Now, most of the medicines administered fall into what we would expect in terms of 16th, 17th, 17th century medical care. So there's extensive use of um, herbal treatments. And we have some lists that survive of the sorts of um, essences that are being and waters that are being sent out to the hospitals. One of the frustrating things is that we don't necessarily know always how these ingredients are being combined. So um, the ideas about early modern medical treatments in this context are quite tentative. But Thibaldi is very helpful because he, he writes, though he doesn't give specific remedies, that there ought to be particular qualities to the medical care being provided in these hospitals. And in fact, he provides a checklist of three qualities which should distinguish the medicines being uh, distributed in the plague hospitals. Encouragingly for his patients, the first criterion was that treatment should be appropriate to the illness. His second was that medicines must be easily prepared and administered on a large scale. And the third, that the ingredients be easily available and plentiful. So he talks about being able to um, conjure up remedies for 500 people at a time. 
and he makes mention of ingredients like senna leaves, cinnamon, vinegar and mustard. So what he draws to our attention is the need for mass catering for treatments for the plague within the lazaretti, which necessarily will have affected the types of medicines which were used, making it particularly likely that the substances combined were common and readily and cheaply available in large quantity. In his account of plague in early modern England, Paul Slack has written that no one could argue that the appeal of contemporary medical knowledge lay in its instrumental success. And perhaps the idea of combining cinnamon, vinegar and mustard as a treatment, we might be sympathetic with Slack's assertion. This idea is also supported by a number of early modern contemporary observations. So in one 16th century Venetian account of an outbreak between 1575 and 7, the owners of various medical recipes were denounced because, instead of curing the plague, the medicine simply produced upset stomachs and disturbed the balance of the body's constitution. Prominent amongst these treatments was that, was that of Antonio Gualtiero, who was a merchant from Flanders, whose preservative required an individual to drink a measure of his, of his own urine at dawn, with the sick required to do the same every morning and evening, and any swellings or wounds and sores were treated with hot faeces rather than balms, as would be more conventional, and cleansed with urine if necessary. It's recorded that Gualtiero went, in order to prove his secret, to the houses of the quarantined poor, where, unfortunately, he contracted symptoms of the disease, treated himself according to his own recipe, and within a short time was said to be sick to his stomach, and he died. A number of contemporary observers um, make the point that many people came forward in times of plague with promises of true remedies for the plague, and very few were successful. We know that many plague hospital doctors had their secrets. Some of these were circulated in cheap print around urban centres. Some were retained for service within the plague hospitals. But very few of them seem to have been credited with any degree of success. But there is one in the context of Venice which does stand out from the rest as having been highly praised and valued and which actually was purchased at great expense by the Venetian Republic in the second half of the 16th century so that it could be used through the 16th and 17th centuries, both in Venice but also in its extensive um, mainland and overseas empire. This cure was owned by the health office doctor Colocchi, who I've already mentioned, and later his son-in-law Olivieri, who um, I mentioned for their long service. The secret was actually the dowry that came to Olivieri as part of his marriage to Niccolò Colocchi's daughter, which gives you some sense of the value placed upon this remedy. In the case of descriptions of this cure, a strong claim was made that it did bring about successful, effective treatment. Similar to the confident assertions of efficacy made of plague remedies up until the mid 15th century, which have been considered by Sam Cohen. So generally the chronology goes that up until the mid 15th century, there's a high degree of confidence that doctors have produced remedies which will cure the plague. And that this really does disappear to some extent between the mid 15th and mid 16th centuries and then seems to pick up again. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this particular treatment in the context of Venice. In Colocchi's recipe, he set down ways in which both painful and non-painful swellings might be treated. Larger swellings would, be, um, would have medicines applied in order to draw poisons to the surface, and then the swelling would be cut, squeezed well in order to push out the pus and any rot, and then a second ointment would be applied to the wound, which would always include rose oil. The whole thing was then covered with fabric and followed by a layer of egg white. For smaller swellings, the process was less invasive because a remedy was applied which it said made cutting unnecessary, although if it was necessary to cut, a cross-shaped incision would be made and a treatment along with candied sugar put inside the growth. There were also treatments that should be ingested internally, including extracts of daffodil, rhubarb and rose, along with compound essences, 
uh, waters of endive were prescribed with a strict diet of soup and water and no wine. But the really distinctive element of this treatment came on the second day when patients would be treated with a water of myrtle along with bloodletting if they were thought to be too hot and then ointments for their swellings which included various herbs like linseeds and saffron along with rose water. Kolokki distinguishes between his patients on the basis of their age. Um, we know that children were often accommodated separately within plague hospitals, but there's very little evidence as to how they were actually treated once they got beyond the age at which they were breastfed. So largely, they're a significant but silent group in, play, in uh, health office records. But Kolokki provides separate instructions for children. Um, first of all, saying those between 10 and 15 could be given a smaller dose of the above medicine. But for those aged between 3 and 10, they would be treated with gentle oils like sweet almond with some added sugar and saffron, which was said, said to defend and purge the body. Actually administering these medicines to children must have been something of a logistical nightmare. In the context of Genoa, the head of the hospital there gives a sense of just how difficult it was to um, get children to actually take medicines like this. He wrote that as soon as children saw the plague hospital doctor, they would begin to shout and try to run away because they'd already learnt to fear pain. So it would be necessary for a wet nurse to hold them down and for the surgeon with great skill and patience to administer any treatment. But he also advised that staff practice an age-old technique of distraction, recording one child who would not be treated unless the surgeon let him hold forceps and a lancet. He recorded a memorable treatment used on some children in Genoa, this time to combat putrefaction on the scalp. There were said to be such disgusting and deep-rooted scabs on the children's heads that it appeared as though part of the skull had become rotten. So a Scottish surgeon suggested finding two black hens. These were then cut in two and each child had one of these placed on his or her head and tied like a bonnet so that it would stay in place when the children moved their heads. And these hen hats remained in place for two days and two nights. When they were removed, it was said that they had absorbed all of the corrupt material and scabs from the scalp. And thereafter, the children were treated with ointment for ordinary sores, and they were said to recover completely. The use of hens is actually not all that unusual. We have um, evidence of similar methods being used on adults in Rome and Palermo. But it's noticeable that here the doctors are having to accommodate the lively nature of the children with whom they're dealing to tie down these hens to allow these uh, remedies to have time to work. Kolokki's treatment for children, as one might expect, was a little bit more conventional and more easily used for a large number of patients. And as I said, the key feature of his remedy was the herb myrtle. And it seems as though the crucial point was that the correct variety of myrtle should be used, since he dedicates quite a number of paragraphs to the three different varieties of myrtle that might be available in different cities and which one it is that should feature in his treatment. It was this herb that was the distinctive feature of his cure and at the heart of its claims to success. The education and training of doctors like Kolokki does remain difficult to investigate, but it's clear that they were experienced professionals who came into dangerously high levels of contact with the sick. One of the things that's been widely assumed about the plague hospital doctor is the ubiquitous costume, which has been said to have been worn as a form of protection. And certainly the outfits that these doctors might have been wearing has received much more attention than any of the medicines that they might have been administering. And I want to um, finish by passing some comments on the use of occupational clothing for public health workers, including the doctors. First, I think it's worth saying that it was not unusual by the 16th century for people working in the sphere of public health to don some sort of occupational symbol or sign on their clothing. So anybody who worked in a plague hospital would be marked out, normally with some sort of white sign. 
Um, those who were thought to be in particularly dangerous occupations, like body clearers, those responsible um, for finding corpses and then taking them to the place of burial, um, would often have something like a brass bell attached to their le legs, something that made them really very noticeable. By the 17th century, these body clearers were having their um, clothing shaped by the health office, not only so that they would be noticeable and identifiable to the wider public, but also to protect their health. And so these individuals are instructed to wear tarred cloaks and advised to carry aromatics. Similar um, fabrics seem to have been worn by serving priests as well. Um, we have a number of uh, records of priests wearing wax hooded cloaks. Um, in all of these cases, because the materials were thought to have a smooth surface, it was thought less likely to carry infected air particles. Priests were also advised to wear gloves so that they would be un unharmed by touching objects or people, and always advised to wear shoes to avoid stepping in anything unpleasant or infected. But in the records of the Venetian Health Office, there is no evidence for specific occupational clothing for plague hospital doctors, at least before the 17th century. Instead, doctors were simply given the general advice issued to most people that um, they wear clothes which would uh, lessen the chance of carrying miasmatic air. So the sorts of fabrics that I was just mentioning, smooth, treated fabrics. It was in France that we have the earliest evidence of um, occupational costumes for plague doctors. Um, in fact, in Rouen, in 1620, the doctor de Lampierre suggested that over ordinary clothes, doctors should wear a pleated tunic, which has been immersed in preservatives, which prevent the entrance of bad air into the clothes. And as soon as they've finished their visit, it's necessary to air these clothes. He also recommended holding a handkerchief at the nose or putting scented oil on the temples, the mouth and the nose and wearing gloves, which should be sufficiently thin to, wear, to, to be able to feel a pulse, but nevertheless still um, substantial enough to protect the doctor and finally to carry a white stick. And many of these elements you can see featured in these illustrations. Charles de Lorme, who was the doctor to Louis XIII, suggested in 1619 in Paris that a plague doctor dressing should think of himself as arming for battle. And he advises having an outfit made of Moroccan leather, which bad air would struggle to penetrate, and placing garlic and rue in the mouth and breathing in incense and making sure that um, a doctor's eyes were covered with glasses. From France, this costume may have come to Italian cities in around about 1630. That's certainly when we have um, first mention of these outfits in archival records. In Lucca, for example, doctors were advised to imitate the habits of French doctors and wear a long waxed outfit, hooded with crystals at the eyes. No such explicit advice survives for Venice, although it was around about this time that the city's body clearers began to wear tarred cloth, so it's perfectly plausible that the doctors would have worn a similar fabric. But at the same time at which the full plague doctor costume became influential in Europe, the Venetian experience of plague, and indeed the experience of plague in many Italian cities, began to change. In Venice, after 1630, the city wasn't affected by another epidemic. Although its trading partners continued to be affected and the city's plague hospitals continued to operate as protective sites to which suspected cases amongst those coming into the city could be taken, the prominence of plague as a public health threat declined. Plague hospital doctors began to lose their prominent position within the public health administration and where there was a doctor appointed to serve the hospitals, he was often referred to as an assistant to the doctor for the city and appointed on a temporary basis and was not particularly well paid. 
So despite the fact that the plague hospital doctor costume is ubiquitous in Venice, particularly during Carnival, there's actually little evidence that it was ever used, mainly because there, and in some other Italian cities, public health structures appear to take effect and have success in protecting the populace just at the time when these outfits became popular, coming as they did from France. Before plague rescinded from Europe during the 18th century, there is no doubt that it was actively combated in the name of public health. There was considerable investment in an array of medical treatments, from the traditional to the experimental. The role of the plague hospital doctor was varied and important, but these were not the carnivalesque figures familiar to modern eyes. Instead, these were learned figures who took on a responsible and highly valued position within health offices. Despite the much more famous outfits and ubiquitous beaks, it was in fact the books and personal remedies of these medical professionals which secured their reputations. These medical treatments were credited with curing approximately a third of the cases of the sick admitted to Venetian institutions. And as a result, because they contributed to the reputation of these institutions as efficacious, played a part in securing sustained state support for the elaborate public health systems that had been created in the 15th century, which centred upon these hospitals and institutions of quarantine. And it's precisely these structures that lie at the heart of explanations as to why plague was largely eradicated from Europe, gradually from around about 1630, but certainly from the turn of the 18th century.